Assalamu alaikum. Welcome to another episode of Boys in the Cave. This podcast is proudly supported by Night Watchman Sports and Muslim Youth Today. My name is Tanzim and today we have a very special and long overdue guest with us today. He is a writer and activist, student of Arabic, Islamic sciences, philosophy, economics. He is a spokesperson of Hezbollah Tahrir Australia. He has participated in many dialogues, lectures and de- debates. The most well-known debates being with Samuel Green about the way forward for humanity, Islam or Christianity and also with Lawrence Krauss who is a theoretical physicist, cosmologist and leading atheist in regards to the topic. Is a belief in God uh, prohibitive or liberating? So, Assalamu alaikum, Uthman Bada, and welcome to Boys in the Cave. Wa alaikum salam, thank you very much, it's pleasure to be here. Yeah, it's been long overdue because um, it's a funny story how I know you, and I want to sl- kind of delve into my perception of you before meeting you, because we've known each other for like quite some time now because yeah. we're playing yeah. the same cricket team, but getting to that, like um, my kind of perspe- uh, perception of Hezbo Tahrir was basically, uh, by the way, like to make it clear, this podcast isn't like, you know, run by Hezbo or anything, but... Like some, we know each other, subhanAllah. So the whole idea of what I wanted to delve into is the perception of Hezbollah Tahrir in the media. And I guess before I started university, so I was in year 11 and 12, you'd hear, you know, HT this, HT that in the media. And uh, it's basically males in a suit telling you, you know, they're very radical and this, that. And, um, you know, you kind of steer away from this and you just like these guys, big beards. Um, they're preaching something that's kind of scary and I should mm. stay away from That's like your... Kind of perception but and i hear your name with my brother this that and then um subhanallah i think i'm um, heading to uni and then i see you doing like intellectual talks and discussions mm. and panels so i'm like this guy's talking about you know does god exist and all that i'm like how is how can the two kind yeah, of like yeah. come together right yeah. so subhanallah i guess some um, the more like um i interacted you know with the crowd of you know you going to um some stuff for example you said and you, um you want to stub you and stuff and doing this kind of talks i realized like I've got to kind of look into what you guys are actually saying. And subhanAllah, I think um, one of the leaders of um, Hezbollah Tahrir, um, Wasim Durei, he was really, there was that video that went viral on ABC. Mm-hmm. And yeah. um, that was like, yeah, Iman, Taqwa, everything like, you know, at a high level. And um, that made me realize, like, he brought up a good point in the end of his video was um, the whole narrative that the conversation be steered towards what the you know the western powers are doing to the muslim lands because always is isis the isis mm, that mm, and mm. all we think is we should be condemning it but the whole kind of shift of focus should be on what are they doing because the isis didn't just pop out of you know you know vacuum like they just the reaction to something so that kind of that kind of line of thinking made me kind of realize a lot of things subhanallah and then and uh, suddenly i'm playing cricket with you for like <laughs> two seasons <laughs> i'm like this guy, if I didn't know he was like Hezbollah Tari, I would have never known. Like, just a normal dude, you know, that subhanAllah. So, uh, that's why we really wanted to get you on board today on Boys in the Cave. Um, so, do you think that's the uh, perception that people normally go through? Even like being a Muslim, you know, because we're all Muslims at the end of the day, but we have different perceptions of each other, mm-hmm. you know? Mm-hmm. Um, I think you probably couldn't generalize. It's, it's only natural that everyone brings their own personalities or subjectivity, if you will, to bear upon whatever they see. So if I see someone and say something, I will usually interpret that through a lens of what I already know and how I already look at the world. 
And so if someone already got some sort of basis in studying you know, politics or he knows about Khilafah or um, you know, debates about God or whatever, he'll look at it in a certain way, others will do it another way. So I think there's different perceptions, but the one that you're mentioning is probably also a fairly prevalent one amongst the Muslim youth where the media portrays us as um, in a very strong light. It's, it's, it's not necessarily... It's negative on their part, uh, but when the Muslims listening, it may, they may not take what we're saying in a negative light, but still it's very strong. And so there's a tendency just to stay away kind of thing, right? Yeah. Because uh, this, this is a bit controversial kind of thing. Um, but it, it's, the, it's the broader interaction. So yes, debates at university, panels, lectures, where you can have a more um, genuine interaction and then people get to see another side, right? Uh, and over time, people can build their that, that allows them to build a, a more genuine perception of 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 ourselves. And I think it, the sad thing is that not only like um, some Muslims like me might have encountered this kind of issue, but even uh, I went to your, um, I think it was your last talk at some uh, University of Sydney. It was the person you were debating. I forgot his name, but one of I think it was a professor or a PhD holder. And he randomly, like in his talk, the talk was about um, does God exist or along those lines. I forgot the topic. But he brought up, like he's talking about religion and Islam, but the whole topic was about God. And he randomly throughout his rebuttal just said, Uthman Bada from Hezbo oh, Like, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> I'm like, how does this even relate to the yeah, topic? Like, bro, yeah. stick to the topic. But like this guy is trying to, like just the fact that he's saying it in a way to kind mm-hmm. of, draw like a kind of perception of you in a negative way without yeah. actually saying he's just saying no it just has just that yeah. whole baggage he throws on the audience it seems like you know he's got everyone like in this thing where you shouldn't be there kind of thing if that yeah, makes sense yeah, and yeah. subhanallah like you went about the whole topic to actually address the, t- the topic but yourself, yeah. these guys are trying to like divert the whole conversation so i guess we live in that kind of society where as you, as I might have mentioned before, that the conversation is not steered towards where it should be. That I don't know if it's the government or if it's the media that they kind of, you know, steer the direction where they want it to be. And do you think that's a big issue in the kind of climate that we live in? Yeah, absolutely. Um, but I, I take it more as a natural might not be the right word, but that's the way things are, right? So nothing's neutral. No one sort of, even though you know, dominant liberal discourses try to portray it that way. You know, as if everything neutral, everyone can have their say and be part of the debate. But everything, everyone's got agendas, everyone's got certain normative positions, ideological positions, and uh, we know what the government's want, we know what the media tries to do. And so it's about, I think it's about recognising that that's how it's going to be and then seeing, well, where do we find ourselves in that? And, you know, coming to your point about that, that particular debate at Sydney Uni, I, I think it's, you know, Islam is, as we'll come to we talk about today, Islam is... Is, is vast. It's got various aspects or elements to it, but we find in the, in, in our current um, situation, some aspects are far more controversial than others. Right? So you can have a debate about God and in, in a university or anywhere. That's not going to be seen as too controversial. But if you talk about more political, economic issues, uh, you know, Western foreign policy, all of a sudden, that's a much more uh, difficult area to navigate. And that's one way. If you want to, if, if you do go there, you will be painted in a certain light. And then, because it's a very negative light, people try and use that to, to discredit you, as you mentioned. But for us, it's a question of do we leave certain areas away, um, or we are, are we going to do Islam the justice it deserves by addressing addressing it or portraying it with the comprehensiveness with which Allah Subhanahu wa Taala revealed it to His Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Awesome. So the whole idea of you navigating towards that kind of um, political kind of realm of Islam, like that's where I want to kind of hone in because I guess that's where the kind of, um, you know, Muslims, whether it be anywhere around the world, is kind of divided on where is that even a realm to navigate into? Mm. Is that mm. Islam even part of, you know, the political realm? Mm. And that's something like I feel like from my kind of um, growing up in Australia, you have like three camps that I've kind of observed. One is just more, you know, chilled and um, laid back and saying, you know, work on yourselves and, you know, iman, taqwa, increase these. Like, not that it's not important, but that's the only thing Islam is. And I guess Islam's put into a bubble of, you know, just work on yourselves, help people around you. And then inshallah, like, you know, those Muslims that are suffering overseas, mm. you know, they will, you know, be, you know, it'll, the success that, you know, of the Khilafah will eventually happen due to, you know, the internal kind of Islam. 
And then there's the camp of, you know, this very secular Muslims that just go about life, not really concerned, not too much. They do the bare minimum of praying and all that, mm. but they just like, okay, I live in this society, you know, this, that, just go about their life. And then I guess there's your camp where it's more, um, you can say if you're in this camp or not, but it's more like we have to do the activism out there. We have to get people to know about these issues and talk about them and really address it head on. And also um, the bringing out the ideology, ideology of you know Islam being a kind of political force, and then taking examples from you know uh, Islamic history. So, do you think bringing these kind of camps into mind? Do you think these exist, or do you think there are more groups, or would you kind of frame it in that? Yeah, way? I think that's a fair characterization. Obviously, all of these groups will be will have a bit more nuance in terms of spectrums. So. You know, this the last one. More people are active. I think there are different ways of being active. HT is a particular way. There's other. There's other. In other words, other Muslims who also give importance to political, economic, social issues, but they do so in different ways with different focus areas or different approaches, right? But otherwise, yeah, you get. We, we might say that you know, a certain group of Muslims is not really not really engaged in Islam beyond a very, very individual level, uh, if at all. Um, and then there's others who are engaged, but who see the need of the focus to be on personal development, spiritual development, and that's somehow meant to manifest ex- externally or ex- in the exterior by itself. And then there's people who um, are also engaged and involved and active, but uh, individually as well as at a social or a political level. I think it's a fair characterization, but you just you probably got to know that there's important distinctions in each of them um, that are important to bear in mind. And that's where I guess I wanted to really talk about the whole idea of Khilafah. Like a lot of maybe listeners are very, they've never heard about the concept because they live in the West. Mm. And would you say that kind of the more, because you just mentioned about the group, um, your group, you know, doing certain level activ- uh, activism and there's other groups that are doing the same mm. amount kind of activism. But don't you think the problem might be that there's too many groups doing it out there that they're all kind of divided? It's like the more groups there are, the more division there would be. And if so, like, because one group, you know, I guess the whole idea of khilafah and unity in Islam, but it's only just one group. It's like, you, as, you, as we said, there are three kind of, you know, groups of, you know, Muslims, but... How can we kind of, how can you say that, okay, you're doing all these things that's going to help all of the Ummah when all of the Ummah are not even mm. um, integrated on like the same kind of issues, you mm. get me? So Yeah, um, I mean, that, that is that's a common way in which some Muslims characterize uh, you know, intra-Muslim dynamics, which is to say that there's a lot of groups and, you know, the, the multiplicity of groups creates further division and, and whatnot. I tend to think of it in a very different way, which is that in the end, Allah Ta'ala wants to see our, um, you know, us being active Muslims and our sincerity. So, so long as those differences are based in sincere understandings, because in the end, most of the differences are based on a different way of reading Islam, right? Uh, as long as it's sincere, then that can't be part of the problem. And for me, really, it's the vast majority who are not doing much or who are not engaged in so there's some people who do things collectively, and I think there's an obvious logical um, point to be made about the efficacy of collective work over individual work. And But there's others who work individually as well. There's lots of individual da'is and speakers who do a lot of good work as well. But I would, I would say that the vast majority of Muslims don't do anything in this realm of trying to revive Islam or in this realm of trying to... Uh, whatever their conception is of, of Khilafah or otherwise... But they they're too far engrossed in just getting the day to day stuff of the, of the dunya, right? And so the question, the way I look at it is that's more of a problem than people trying to do something, albeit in different ways, right? And in fact, I'd say I'd go further and say if all those who weren't doing anything uh, started doing things, I think the ummah would move places much quicker because what we find is although there's a number of different groups and areas and individuals, there's always resource resource limitations. Um, that every group faces and therefore you can only do so much. Whereas in the end, I think if someone's doing something beyond your person, obviously hopefully people are praying and fasting and whatnot, but beyond that, at a community level, if you're doing something, I think that's much better than not doing not doing anything. Um, and if you're doing it as part of a collective effort, I think that's better, but 
I think the first important thing is people should be doing things. I don't think anyone would claim that the situation of the Ummah, which everyone can see in terms of how it is, will, will just improve by itself uh, without us doing anything. Everyone can understand that, right? So therefore, those doing things are better, I think, than those who are not doing anything. So long as, as I said, it's sincere and it's, it's uh, based on Islam. The only other point I think that's relevant here is sometimes the divisions or the the problems are exacerbated by the way certain people from different groups interact with each other. So there's an, there's an element of groupishness, if you will, right? In a negative sense, a cultishness, my group, your group, you know. That's, that's negative, that's a problem. And I think there needs to be better ways of interaction where, fine, you understand things differently, let's have a discussion, let's talk about it. In the end, we're not going to get everyone to agree, right? That's not the nature of how human beings think. Let's you do what you think is best. I'll do what I think is best. Let's have an open discussion about that. Let's keep lines of communication open. Let's look at each other in a light of you know fellow sincere Muslim doing what he thinks is best for the ummah, and therefore that's good. So the other, so there's that interaction, how we interact, and certainly there are problems there. But in origin, I think uh, the problem is not that there's too many groups, but I think the problem is that there's not enough people doing much to try and improve the lot of okay. the ummah. Because I guess you're saying well, if, um, you need that collective effort and you need those groups to kind of have that sincere intention. But I guess if you're talking about from a political organization kind of point of view, um, they're all kind of working for the Khilafah. So firstly, I just want to kind of break it down for, you know, get the kind of, we want to, I really want to go into the crux of mm. the Khilafah. Mm. And what are we working towards or like, is there kind of... Um, differences opinion of like should it like what does it mean by working towards the Khilafah and what it is and the, maybe perhaps even the history behind it so I just want you to kind of define like what is a Khilafah like what what does it mean um that's a, obviously you're right it's a very important question um let me try and address it from a sort of more simple perspective first and then we can go into some details um basically to put it if I were to put it like in a very simple with a simple way of expressing it, I'd say that Khilafah is the vehicle or the means by which Islam is implemented. And I may qualify that by saying all of Islam or Islam comprehensively is implemented, but I don't like that qualification because it makes it look like an additional thing. Whereas what I think people, our, what our goal or what we should try and hope that the Ummah understands is that Islam is comprehensive. And at some level they do understand. So everyone sort of Chucks out the cliche, Islam is a comprehensive way of life, Islam is a complete way of life, right? And so if anyone who believes that, then surely politics, economics, society, all this is part of life. And so really, at one level, Khilafah just stands for the way by which you implement Islam in its totality, right? If, if we were to be a bit more specific, um, classical scholars, for example, would define it in more specific terms of succession, because that's what the word means in Arabic, Khilafah is a successor, that's what Khilafah were called. Khulafa because they succeeded, i.e. they came after and represented the Prophet ﷺ in doing what he did in terms of implementing Islam, as opposed to the other role that the Prophet ﷺ served. He had two main roles. One was the reception or the receiving of wahi, and the other one was the implementing of that wahi. Now, obviously, the reception closes with his death, وسلم, but the role to implement continues. And that's the point, that once he, when he was alive, Prophet ﷺ, he was receiving and implementing, showing how Islam is implemented individually, you know, in your capacity as a father, as a brother, as a whatever, but also in, uh, on society. Um, and when he passed away, Abu Bakr was the first Khalifa, and this is where the concept comes from, that it was his role now to implement, to, you know, practice, to put into, put into practice the deen in its totality, right? And when we're saying its totality, obviously, people can pray on their own, right? I don't, we don't need someone to, you know, need a system necessarily for people to pray, although it's part of it. Even, even Salah has certain elements that are linked to the Khilafah. But in, in, they can do it in theory. People can pray, people can fast. But there's certain aspects that individuals just can't do, like the economic system, uh, you know, your politics, your foreign policy, how you interact with other states and whatnot. So Khilafah, in that sense, is the vehicle by which Muslims are meant to implement Islam. And if you don't have it, this is what, this is what emphasizes its importance. If you don't have it, you can only ever practice a partial Islam, parts of it, 
right? I can pray, I can fast, I can do a number of things, but there are vast areas that I cannot simply do properly. So, for example, in fiqh, the scholar would talk about ibadat and mu'amalat, right? Uh, ritual worships and transactions where people interact and contracts and all sorts of stuff. The vast majority of the mu'amalat cannot be done without the khilafah. So, you know, for example, take something like riba. Riba is haram, every Muslim knows it. And therefore, you know, Islam has a financial, economic frameworks that are built on not having any interest, not having any riba. But you, an individual can't do anything about that. He, he, it's not within his realm, right? I can contract with people and try to avoid it, but at a society level, I can't do anything. Likewise, the same can be said of various social ahkam, um, fiqh, political, etc., and so on and so forth. And so, in, in a simple sense, khilafah is the vehicle to implement Islam as, uh, in its entirety. And I think when you put it that simply, you think, well, you know, it's sort of almost a common sense point, but the reason I feel people, Muslims, perhaps don't necessarily see it that way is because we live in a time where the dominant paradigms uh, structure our thinking in a way where we think on individual terms. And that's that's the liberal framework. It forces you to think, not forces you, but it's, it, it is structured itself um, atomistically. What that means is individuals, you think about individuals, you start from the individual, and many Muslims, most Muslims have internalized that sort of thinking. So when we talk about Islam or anything else, we think about the individual first. Right? We go, hey, the individual, Islam is, I believe in Allah, I fix my aqidah, I pray, I fast, I give charity, I try to be good, etc., I fix my morals. Uh, and then, but what that type of thinking does is the social aspects, the political aspects are almost an afterthought. So if someone comes in with me, oh yeah, but Islam is complete, it's called, oh yeah, yeah, it's true, but it's an afterthought. And therefore, we, you know, we, you almost have to do this work which you think would not be needed in, in stating the obvious, which is to say, yeah, Islam is a complete way of life. But what does that mean practically? You can't do anything with a complete way of life if I can only present 5, 10, 15, 20% of it. So that, 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 that at the basic level is, is Khilafah. Historically, it was implemented. There's a long history. We can talk about that. Um, and those are the big, massive questions about its possibilities in the modern age as well. But anyway, in, in brief, that's that's what the Khilafah is. So do you think, like, from kind of a, let's just say, for example, a guy just living in the West, you know, great life, you know, a lot of money, he, he's practicing Islam. Let's cricket well, on the weekend. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, like, um, why, what, why does it matter, like, he laughed to him? Because can't he just say, you know, Allah put me in this situation where I can't be living in this society, so, like, I just happen to live in this society, so why does it, like, I'm trying to do as much of Islam I can within my kind of... Um, context yeah. so it shouldn't matter that okay i need to go out and and what do i exactly do even so yeah, what do you yeah. reckon? um well, obviously look allah says la yukulif allah wa nafsan illa wa sa'ana allah doesn't burden his soul more than he can be right so definitely people are held accountable within their capacity but the assumption here in in, in this hypothetical person who represent many actual people uh is that because i live in the west i can't do anything i think that's where the problem is Right, so yes, there's living in a khilafa, and if you were living in a khilafa, things would be very different. Um, so you don't, you live in the West, you live in a modern nation state, secular, it's democratic, it's liberal. Um, and so yeah, you're not going to be held accountable for why you didn't live in a khilafa. But uh, whether here or in the Muslim world, there's no Islamic, proper Islamic government in the Muslim world either. Wherever you live in the world, it's one thing to talk about uh, the current system you live in, live under, but it's another thing to ask, well, what can I do to move towards correcting things, right? Um, which is the other part of the question of why khilaf is important for someone living in the West uh, or anyone in the world. It's important because in the end, our goal in life is to seek Allah's pleasure. Uh, and Allah's pleasure, as we understand, as all Muslims understand, lies in us doing what He wants us to do, which was demonstrated practically by the Prophet Wasallam, right? And so if this is how the Prophet implemented Islam, this is how he practiced Islam. It wasn't just individual, there were social, economic, political aspects to it. That's what I need to strive for. And I put the emphasis there on strive, which is which is what? Which is, I could be living, let's say I was born in the 15th century and I was living um, in the Khilafah. I have all sorts of other tests. There's probably jihad on the Western frontier, right? There's probably a particular governor who's, who's oppressive, perhaps. So I have to enjoy the good and forbid the evil. In other words, it's just different historical times 
different historical contingencies merely change the type of the test you have. So the person living in the West, yeah, you're not accountable because of the Khilafah, you can't build it yourself, but you are responsible for what you did or didn't do in trying to strive for it, right? Which brings us to the other question um, of well, what can you do, right? Um, and there's much you can do, but again, for us, the role model is the Prophet Wasallam. He spent a number of years in Mecca before he was living in an Islamic governance in Medina. And the question for us is, what did he do in Mecca? Right? Was it only working on himself or was he doing more? Um, and again, without getting into too much details, because there's a lot to talk about here, but in brief, we will understand that there's a, there's a da'wah component to Islam, which is that I, I practice Islam to the best of my ability, but I also try to convey the message in word and deed to other people. Right? And I think this is where a lot of, again, there's a, there's a structure of liberal thinking which goes in the other direction. You meant to mind your own business, you know, you meant to just do your own sort of thing, enjoy life and whatnot, which again affects many Muslims living in the West. But anyone who accepts the concept of da'wah, which is a core aspect of Islam, understands that there's that role to pass on, to enjoin good, to forbid evil, to advise. And so, the, and so in, this con, in this aspect, there's a lot anyone living in the West or in the East could do. Right, so just look at one aspect of that, which would be to to assist in the work, to um, increase, improve the understanding of Muslims that Islam is a complete way of life of which Khilaf is a part. Right, so we might call that. Let's refer to that as developing a Muslim political consciousness. So Muslims are politically conscious. That's work everyone can do because all it entails is me learning first, gaining some knowledge, understanding, and then conveying it. And in this sense, we're not really asking people to do some, anything radical. It's, it's just that we already have learning in Islam. We already have seeking knowledge. right? We go and seek knowledge of Quran and Fiqh and Hadith and whatnot. Or at least people should. Uh, more people should. And we understand that this needs to be conveyed at some level. But all we're saying is that the scope needs to be expanded. And this, what sort of over time has become a very secularized understanding of Islam needs to be expanded and the same applies in these other areas learn about the political system of islam and speak about it raise awareness about it and that's the first step towards striving towards living practicing islam the way allah wants us so like i can i use an example from this year like for example when rasul Islam, you know told a group of people to uh, migrate to abyssinia under the king of jashi can't you argue that okay um it's it's like you don't have to be striving for a khilafah because they're you know in safety because they're under a just ruler for example so don't don't you think like that example could mean that okay it doesn't necessarily have to be okay khilafah this khilafah that you get me so what what would you like mm. respond to that well you can argue that people have argued that uh, prominent people Sheikh um, Muhammad Abdullah out in Griffith University he argues a very Abyssinian model they call it the Abyssinian model where they say that our situation in the West is not like Mecca or Medina, it's like Abyssinia. And so when we live in Abyssinia, this is, this is um, their, their position, when we live in Abyssinia in the West, we just have to practice Islam to the extent we can and that's it. Because Muslims in Abyssinia didn't try to change the system or anything like that. The problem with that type of a framework, it should be obvious, which is what? Which is that Abyssinia is a footnote to the Sirah. What I mean by that is, without Mecca and Medina, Abyssinia makes no sense. You get it? So, Prophet some struggling in Mecca, times are tough, and, that's, and this is how the da'wah is meant to be, if you're doing it properly. There's persecution, there's people, you know, there's propaganda against you. It gets really tough for some people. So, the Prophet allows some of them to migrate temporarily, right, emphasis on some and on temporarily, to a different city. The struggle in Mecca continues, and it's meant to continue. It, it, t- it takes fruition in Medina. And at a certain point, he calls them back. So you can see, you can almost see Abyssinia as a, um, what's the word? You know, we pit stop. Yeah, right. almost a pit stop. A pit stop, a bit more than that, right? You just go off the path and you come back on. But if I get rid of the main path and I go where in Abyssinia permanently, that makes no sense. It's like okay, just so you just want to live and have a good time, and you know, uh, that, that 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 that's why I think it's not a very, it's not a very um, robust reading or a rigorous reading of the seal. You have to read Abyssinia in the context of Mecca and Medina, and the way, therefore, that would that would uh, come out is to say, yeah, some people 
who are having it really tough in certain places. I wouldn't count Australia within that because it was yeah. doing mighty fine, mightily fine here. But yeah, there are places in the world where it's really tough. Central Asia, uh, most parts in the Muslim world, right? Yeah, Allah will look, look at those people in their capacity of what they could or they couldn't do. Um, but everyone else, you have to, you have to try and uh, be part of that main struggle, be part of that effort in that Prophet was trying to do in, in Mecca that gave fruit to what we saw in Medina. So like how we're like kind of breaking it down, like what I feel like um, learning Islam and growing up in the West, we're kind of just given the whole idea of, you know, learn Iman, uh, you know, uh, increase Iman, you know, pray five times and, you know, give zakah. So why do you feel like this kind of angle of looking at, you know, Islam holistically as you perceive Islam to be is kind of uh, missing from the kind of... I think it's you know, missing. Uh, I don't, I don't, it doesn't come as a surprise. Um Society's systems, structures influence individuals, not the other way around. Um, and so, what we've had, there's two, two things that are important here. Number one is the original uh, colonial, cultural colonial invasion of the Muslim world, where what the colonialist the Europeans had brought to the Muslim world was not just material exploitation, but it was also new ways of thinking and new seeds. So, this, you know, for example, nationalism was an unknown idea to Muslims. In its modern formulation, it was unknown. This idea that somehow because I'm Pakistani and someone else is Bengali, that means anything at all, right? It means nothing. And for, for centuries, Muslims, although they were part of the provinces and they had different cultures in the narrower sense, they traveled everywhere and that wasn't that wasn't an issue. But like that, the Europeans have brought other ideas, secularism, other liberal ideas that have been influential over time. And that's in the Muslim world, right? But when you come, when you migrate to the West, it's the same thing on steroids, if I can put it that way, right? Because now you're in, you're in their home, you're on, you're on their home turf, where the whole society is built on those ideas, right? And this is why I think it's really, really important that Muslims give due attention to uh, knowledge, learning, understanding, reading of where we live and the systems of where we live, the ideologies, the frameworks of where we live. The histories and how we've come up to 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 form the societies in which we in which we live. So, for instance, you know, reading about secularism, what it is, what it, what its history is, reading about liberalism, reading about capitalism, globalization, it's very important. A lot of Muslims make the mistake, and here I'm talking about those who've understood the importance of knowledge, because obviously there's some again still haven't understood the importance, and so they're just struggling to day by day, and they're not really involved in any effort in the first place but muslims who alhamdulillah Allah bless them with uh, some sort of return if i can say to islam and they began to practice a lot of the for a lot of them that mean seeking knowledge but in a lot of cases that will restrict that knowledge to your usual fiqh hadith uh, sirah quran how to read which is all very good and very needed and we need more of that but not to the exclusion of understanding the realities and the, the structures of where we live and systems in which we live because islam not a it's not an abstract philosophy. You have to understand what Allah wants you, but you have to implement it where you live, in the world in which you live. And I, mean, I don't mean where you live, I don't mean like Granville or, you know, uh, Auburn, Western Sydney, or even Sydney, or even Australia. I mean the world which we now occupy. The world in which we live now is structured, uh, is ordered in different ways than it was 100 years ago, than it was 200, 300 years ago, than it was under the Khilafah, for example. It's very different. Not only in terms of its politics, its economics, its social aspects, but even in, in the way people think, right? So, which gets us closer to closer back to your question, although that this this point I think is very important to emphasize that people need to give due attention to the study of um, the systems and the, and, the, and the societies in which they live and the ideas, um, the ideologies that that structure those societies. But getting more close, closer to the point. Liberalism at its core is atomistic, it's individualistic. So it teaches us to think in these ways. And that's a very good example of where if you study uh, the history of how things came to be and therefore appreciate dominant modes of thinking, of, of understanding, you see some very important insights, right? So for instance, you know, in Europe, the Reformation uh, formed... The backdrop to the Enlightenment, and the Enlightenment is very important because it brings to the West, you know, the modern conceptions of reason and rationality and science and blah blah blah, freedoms. The Reformation, Protestant Reformation, is important because 
the end concepts of religion that we get out of enlightenment are very Protestant as opposed to Catholic, right? So the very idea of religion as a private belief, as, as, as interior, primarily interior, as not to do with rituals and practices is a very Protestant idea. And that's not the point. That's not the insight. The insight is that the Protestant conception was far more influential than the Catholic one in forming our modern dominant understanding of religion, right? So now religion is religion. We take, when we say religion, what's understood in the West and what's understood by most people in the West is private belief, about morals, about some theology, you believe in God, it's interior, you know, you're a spiritual person, blah, blah, blah. And therefore, anything that tries to put itself as a religion but is political is like a, almost heretical. And that's why you will hear commonly in, in, in the right wing, you know, right wingers in, in America in particular, but around the world go, Islam is not a religion, it's a political ideology. All right? Mm-hmm. What they're trying to say is, what, what that, I forget what they're trying to say, but what that presupposes is religion is something, this is what religion is. It's not political in the first place. You guys are making it political, and therefore it's not, not really a religion. All right? Anyway, leaving them aside, but the point is to understand how we come to these sort of concepts because they influence people. Uh, there's been um, there's been other analogies made with the Protestants where people will say, "Oh, the Protestants are like our Salafis, mm-hmm. right? Because they're less ritualistic and blah blah blah." But I think that's a that's that's a non insightful analogy. What does it t- what does it tell you? It's, like, it's not really translatable. It doesn't tell you anything. It just sounds good, you know, for people who maybe don't agree with Salafis too much either. But I think the more insightful understanding is a Protestant understanding of religion as interior as less, less, less ritualistic, whereas Islam is not less ritualistic. If you look at Islam on its own terms, rituals are very important. We pray five times a day, and it's a very ritualistic type of prayer. It's a very fixed modes, and, you know, so much so much of our ibadah, the scholars say, غير معقول. They don't have, they can't be rationalized. They're not meant to be rationalized. They're meant to be done as they are. It's therefore the practice, Right? And so anyway, that's just a couple of examples. The point is the importance of understanding the societies in which we live. And to your question, the reason people think on individual lines a lot is because, in part, that's what the society teaches us to think. It's very, very individualistic. And so we would appreciate that, but also push back a little. And in fact, to the extent possible, try and leave that aside and think on more uh, genuine Islamic terms, which are not, which Islam does not start on the individual basis, right? It's a very communal faith, or I don't know if you have faith. It's a very communal deen. Uh, it's a very societal deen, whilst not ignoring the role, obviously, of the individual at the same time. But anyway, I think that's why I like, think along those lines. That's why our work is cut out to try and show those other aspects. But you can see the tension. Final point. I'm going to be long here, but you can see the tension here, right? It's like people think along individual lines, but as soon as you say, you know, brother or sister, Islam is a complete way of life. No Muslim says no. Every and you, as soon as you say Islam has got a political aspect. Very few Muslims, except the really hard, hardened secularists, right, um, which are like 0.001% of the Ummah, most Muslims get the point and they say yes, right? And when you show them the Sirah of the Prophet, they can see that it's not, it's not, it's not some individual spiritual struggle alone. It's got so much more. Smart. And they all accept it. So there's this tension. It's just a tension because you've internalized certain concepts which you act on but you also know cognitively, if not at a, at a more conceptual, internalized level, that there's something else. And I think we just need to work on those tensions and push them a little bit to try and make the case that that's not how it is. It's Islam is much more complete, and this is what we want to try and revive. Yeah, so I like to just bounce off what you're saying um, in terms of us being, you know, the way we think is dictated about um, within the society that we live in. Like, um, cause I, I have a blog, so I was writing about the whole idea of, you know, um, the West and the perception, you know, for example, liberalism, liberalism, when, once I was like at school, like learning stuff, for example, uh, in history and the whole idea of, okay, you know, um, when during the times of when Christianity was the rule among the masses and then there was all these scientists that came like Galileo, for example, and they just persecuted them. Mm, mm, and mm. that's the whole perception of religion. Like it's, right. it's brought to you like, okay, see, religion is this thing that oppresses, right. um, you know, pro- progress. And then you get fed that narrative. And then you realize that once you study it carefully, it's like it's only what Christianity went through. Right. Whereas my faith, 
even though I thought that's what religion has become kind of, you know, limits progress. You look at your faith, you look at your Islamic history, it was never the case, right? Sure. We had like Islamic Golden Age, for example, and all that. And not only that, it's very subtle in the ways of, for example, I, I wrote about, um, there was the discovery of the Rosetta Stone. So mm-hmm. Jean Francois, I think, Champollion, I think that's his name. And they'll say like, cause he found the Rosetta Stone, then he um, basically um, unlocked the keys to how to read hier- hieroglyphics. Mm. But subhanAllah, even during the Islamic Golden Age, I think there was a um, guy named Abu Warishi by the, uh, along those uh, lines. Um, what happened was that he actually deciphered about 60 to 70% already. Mm, yeah, yeah. But subhanAllah, how we perceive that, okay, the West has come with this thing and then look how we're progressing. It's a very um, Western kind of ideology that right. we're fed to even from a young age. I, subhanAllah, if I didn't study the deen in a historical lens, you know, um, for, you know, the perspective of Islam, not just looking at the European history, I would have fell into the trap of thinking right. religion limits everything. Yeah. And I guess the whole idea of when people saw the injustices that the kind of Christian rules rulers did to the scientific kind of community that's where the whole idea of liberalism and you know secularism came about as a kind of it will fix that issue of you know unjust rule for example Mm -hmm. in a religion kind of paradigm and i guess that's what uh, i want to delve more into the whole idea of the khilafa because it once you say khilafa just like oh it because but khilafa actually you know builds off from that whole idea you know, but once we say in this context in the West where we live in, it's like, don't bring those two together. Don't bring, yeah, you know, yeah. life and then Khilafah. It just doesn't work, right? But I guess you were talking about, you know, doing things to work towards, you know, Islam or for the Khilafah. I'd like to know what it means by like working towards it. Like what can you actively, like you mentioned, you know, if it might be like Dao or whatever you're suited to and people are going out there and talking about it. But you can say that someone like, is it, you know, ISIS studying a Khilafah, for example? And isn't that problematic if we say in that way? Because it comes back to, you know, the different groups doing, you know, different things that might be for the Khilafah. But how can we establish that, okay, this is the way to do it. But then we have groups like ISIS doing, you know, establishing so-called Khilafah. So mm. how, how do we reconcile that issue? Okay. I wonder in that, that sort of collapses a number of issues. Um before coming to the all-important issue of ISIS, <laughs> um, if I could just comment on your original point about Western history and whatnot, I think the key point to take away is that um, the problem with what the modern Western thinking, if you will, does is that it universalizes. So fine, you had a, Europe had a particular history, things didn't go that well, to, to say the least. Th- that's not the problem, right? You think ha- things happen, you know, life goes on, but... It's one thing to say Christianity went through these these tough times and they had to go through various transformations before they thought they worked things out. It's another thing to go, that's what religion does. And so this is the problem is universalization. Christianity had a particular history, not religions, not everyone, right? But what's happened in the West, um, in Europe in particular, is that the very concept of religion has been one that's been constructed um, in a way where... Because such, it's because it's a European construction, Europeans came up with this idea, European sociologists came up with the idea of religion. Uh, it was so intertwined with Christianity and Christian history, and then the conclusions were just generalized to everyone. Right? So if, because you guys couldn't work out how religion and politics works together, that must mean that everyone, no one can do it. But you're right, we, we, our experience was the complete opposite. Right? The Islamic State, Khilafah, from the very start, uh, was 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 a coherent whole. We had politics, economics, everything, right? And there was no violence because of the mixing of religion and politics, which is a particular way that which is the way that they're reading uh, their own history. Which even that may not be right, right? There's corruption, there's oppression. It's not necessarily just because you've mixed two things. But anyway, the point is that's why we have to question some of these givens, you know. And people don't tend to do that. People tend to go around using the word religion uh, with the dictionary meaning. Uh, because that's what it is. That, that's why there's a need for Muslims, um, particularly you know those Muslims at the forefront of Dawah, to think deeper about these terms. Coming to your the other point about ISIS, um, I'm not sure. To be honest, I'm not sure how relevant ISIS is to, to this discussion. Obviously, they've been around and they've been a, a big part of the debates in recent years. But I think that's more because 
Western governments, uh, Western power found in ISIS a very sharp instrument to continue injuring the, the Ummah and Islam and Muslims, right? Before ISIS, there was Al-Qaeda. Before that, there was the Taliban. Before that, there was uh, the mullahs of Iran and the Iranian Revolution and, and so on and so forth. So these are various instruments. The only difference is, I guess, ISIS has claimed the Khilafah, which others didn't. Although it could be claimed that the Iranian, the Iranian uh, Khomeini claimed some sort of Islamic governance, but I guess that's whole Sunni Shia baggage comes into that discussion. But apart from that, I don't see where ISIS is relevant. No, no Muslim or you know, 99.9% of Muslims clearly saw through ISIS's claims in terms of there being Khilafah. What they did on the ground, if, if it was as reported, uh, clearly was not Islam. And so I think the only uh, purpose ISIS serves in the whole thing is to muddy muddy the waters, if you will, to fog the whole thing and therefore I think we need to just leave them aside and go it doesn't mean it doesn't mean anything um, in fact what I think what I think it should be taken to mean is the dangers of um, the consequences caused by Western foreign policy, which is one of the points you made in your introduction um, and that's it, the West has been experimenting in our lands because that's what it does, um, that's how it treats other people as mere tools and instruments for its own exploitation and that's led to various negative consequences one of them has been isis beyond that if we were to take its claims of khilafah seriously and to go no that's not the khilafah because they did this and they said that i think gives them far more credit than they deserve um and i don't think every person that opens his mouth needs to be responded to okay so basically the whole idea is to analyze how they you know bring up the so-called khilafah in what ways and if it's islamic or not would you say that's the kind of um, this is what determines if it's really a khilafah, if it's done... No, I think there's, a, there's another discussion to be had about, you know, a sort of somewhat theoretical, fiqhi discussion to be had about, well, what are the conditions of khilafah, right? What are they so that when someone declares them, the ummah is able to recognize it? In fact, so, so, so that when you guys, H2, for example, if you guys were to be successful by the grace of Allah and claim a khilafah, how should the ummah judge you? By what? How can she know that what you're claiming is a true khilafah and it's not just another experiment like, for example, ISIS, right? That's a good discussion to have, but I think it needs to be separated from the whole ISIS experiment. But and it's, it's a fiqh discussion. There's, there are there are certain, certain conditions. Um, we can go through them, but I'm not sure it's entirely relevant to the discussion. The point that is, I think, worthy of emphasis is that only when the ummah, uh, only when Muslims, this is what we should encourage, that when Muslims move towards trying to learn more about the political system of Islam, about Khilafah, about its fiqh. Uh, because just, just as there's the fiqh of Salah, there's the fiqh, there's fiqh of Khilafah. Right? There's fiqh of how to appoint a Khalifa. These things all happen. It's not, it's not theory. These things happen for a thousand years. And they didn't happen because people were just making them along as they go. Although various stuff happened in history, but they all have a basis. So the more Muslims learn that, the more aware they become this, these discussions about you know, what are the conditions are part of that. You know what I mean? So there's no way, and even if we come and say these are the conditions, but if if if, if the people hearing that don't have some sort of framework within which to understand those conditions, it doesn't mean much, right? Whereas if you, the way you learn the fiqh of salah and the fiqh of salah, if you have some cognition or some not cognition, if you have some understanding of this fiqh as well, then you'll be better able to appreciate what are the conditions. What does a particular person who's claiming to have established Khilafah require such that I can do that or not? Final point I'd make, however, here is, uh, you know, it, it's probably too much to ask every single Muslim to know the fiqh of Khilafah, you know. It's, in that sense, yes, it's not like the fiqh of Salah where every single person needs to pray. There are certain aspects that everyone should know. Um, but otherwise, a person should either know it or they should, uh, they should have access to people who they trust to know it. You know my point? Like, if, if a person can't learn these things himself, then she needs to have a trustworthy sheikh, a trustworthy da'i or whatever, or stad, who does. Um, but in general, obviously, we're not talking on the individual level. At the collective ummah level, we need to increase that level of awareness of this whole aspect of Islam in its details. And, and indeed, things are only clarified in their detail, in their concrete nature. We can talk, we can talk rhetorically, Islam is khilafah, Islam is a political system, there's a, there's a khalifa, blah, blah, blah. But it's all, it's all sort of pie in the sky sort of stuff without concrete details, right? Um, and I think that's what we need to work towards in, in terms of building that in the ummah. You mentioned like 
when like if like there was a hilafa and you know the fiqh behind it but i want to kind of go into and delve into the idea of the practicality because i guess you can say like if there was a khilaf in today's society what people argue is that okay you know the you know it's very backward and all the rules because you know mm-hmm. it came from the desert for example mm-hmm. but i guess i want to break up to compel compatibility of the khilaf in today's society like in two parts so i kind of want to address the i guess practicality in the sense of you know economics and the whole societal like we see now in today's society like a lot of globalization and there's riba everywhere mm. you know it's all interconnected by banks mm. financial institutions all this kind of stuff do you th- and even like the whole idea of you know because i correct me if i'm wrong but i read where um because you know all the companies that run you know all the important you know for example gas and water and all that companies that you know make money off it but i think in a khilafa what happens is that the government is in charge of those uh, important resources, if mm. I'm correct. Mm. And how, like, since if companies are already kind of, you know, selling and making money off a hacking, you know, in a khilafa randomly, like, kind of fix it in a way where it should be something. When there's already in- financial institutions and how can we kind of, is it possible to effectively implement those Islamic principles within mm. a kind of globalized society of, you know, haram, basically? Yeah. That's a good way of putting it, globalized society of Haram. <laughs> That's a good uh, gloss. Um, I think there's a, a few things here to, to appreciate. In one sense, the Khilafah is not compatible with the modern age. Right? But what do I mean by that? I don't mean that it's not possible. I mean that it can't comfortably fit within the way things are structured now. Politically, economically, socially. And so it's important to understand what we mean by compatible, right? Usually when people are thinking along these lines, they're not thinking of radical ruptures. They're thinking of, okay, things are as they are, and whatever happens is going to sort of gradually come in and somehow it's got to fit in. And, and then the question arises, well, there's riba everywhere, so how are, you going to, how are you going to work the Islamic economic system? There's nation states, there's the UN, how are you going to, you know, what's the khilaf, what's the khilaf going to do? And then there's other important questions about like World Cups and sort of stuff, you know, how are you going to... <laughs> <laughs> you know, no, I kid. Um, but I think, again, that's not a radical enough way of thinking through the problem. The current structure of the world is not compatible with how Islam sees it. That's, and that's just a function of the fact that we've moved so far away from how things were and how things ideally should be as far as Islam is concerned. And so therefore what that means in, in more specific terms is that the Khilafah will signal, in fact, be a, a significant rupture from current things, from how things are currently, right? Otherwise it won't work. Now, how that's going to happen, the practicalities, and it's not something that can be predicted or, or, or sort of delineated in, in a causal sense. This will happen and that will happen and that will, you can't do that. But what we can do, at one level we say, if Allah has obligated this, then definitely it's possible. Because Allah doesn't obligate things that he, that's outside your thing. Number two, we're only responsible to the extent that we can do things. So if truly it's not really possible, and Allah just wants to see you work towards it, then that's what I need to do. Right? Again, that's just theoretical. But in practice, I don't see why it can't be done. But it's just that people shouldn't expect it to be some sort of smooth changeover. It's not going to be smooth. Put it that way. It's a, it's a radical rupture from where the current things are. We have to, you have to break out of the nation-state way of thinking. You have to break out of the international community concept. Uh, you're right. Riba is everywhere. Capitalist companies are everywhere. And there's got to be ways out of that. Um, there are ways out of that. But in, in, in a world where things are very, very interconnected and interrelated, it's difficult to pull things apart in theory to go, okay, well, if we do this and we'll do that and if we do that. So rather what we, sh- we, what we can do and what we tend to do in the Hizab is have a good understanding of what Islam wants us to do, study the current realities to the best of your ability and have particular plans in place. But in the end, you can't plan anything. And there's a big room in Islamically from a, from a Akhida perspective and from a spiritual perspective where it's Allah who does, it's Allah who brings things to fruition, right? We're not materialists, we always sit there and go, okay, here's the whole plan, here's the map, and we're going to follow this, and because we're going to do everything, because we're going to get everything right, we're going to end up at this destination. That's another thing that we've internalized from, from, from dominant paradigms, a materialist way of thinking, right? But in any case, there's certain things we can do, in theory, I don't see why it's not possible. It is possible. Things change. Paradigms change. And we've seen that in history. Big changes happen. right? And we should expect to be a bigger change. But again, the fundamental point is that we need to 
work towards it, do what we can for it, wherever we are. Right? Obviously, this is something that will start in the Muslim world. It's not going to start in the West in terms of the actual change. And so there's a, there's a whole different nature of work over there. And then there's complementary work that we can do in the West. And there's probably like, so we discussed about that kind of angle, but there's also another angle of the Khilafa, basically the rules in place or enforced uh, upon the masses. Like, for example, the most famous one, I guess, um, non-Muslims quote is, you know, the cutting off the hand if you mm, steal mm. or like, you know, punishment to adulterers and, you know, lashings and all that. It's like, it's not fit for a society that we live in. And so how can we kind of, rec- should we reconcile? Or if so, like, how can we reconcile that in kind of, the modern uh, modern age, and is there a room for you know in the Sharia to kind of um, gloss over these kind of punishments and instate new ones? For example, is it possible within um, a khilafa? Again, a couple of things. Number one, there is flexibility in the Sharia, but well, I'm not sure flexibility is the best word, but on its own terms, right? What that means is that there's certain areas that Allah has left for people to decide on, but it's those areas that the Sharia specifies not what we come up with and so what what isn't right is we go well people today think that this is a really backward thing let's try and see if we can change it a little bit tweak a little bit because then you just then your reference point becomes what people are saying but what people are saying and thinking and doing is a very historically contingent thing it changes all the time right and that's the whole point that uh your sort of overriding paradigms are what uh, inform you or what create the specific ways in which you understand the world, right? And so, you know, there was a time in Europe when all sorts of um, corporeal punishments, bodily punishments on the body, uh, were normal, right? Um, where, where religion was understood in a very, very different way, very what some people call a, a very enchanted world with spirits and demons and, you know, jinn and, and angels and whatnot. Today that's changed. Today you, you, you looked at funny if you believe in angels, right? Forget, and that's, a, and that's a good point. Forget cutting the hand and all this stuff. You believe in angels, you're crazy. That's crazy talk, right? Yeah. <laughs> so, so what are you going to try to think? I'm going to try to think there's a flexibility here. Maybe we can, <laughs> maybe we can, you know, just put so the angels to the side for now. It's, it's, it doesn't work that way. So it's, it's the other way around. If we, we need to stick to Islam as it is, where, where there is flexibility and it's so fine, you can do, you can do things, but otherwise... We need to work on trying to convey it and implement it as it is and change the perceptions of people, right? And that's what we see in society all, over, all the time. You know, a very recent example that people can identify with is homosexuality. Again, 50 years ago, 100 years ago, it was really, really bad. Now it's so, so important that if you don't allow people the freedom to do it, then you're really, really bad, right? Mm-hmm. So that, that's a massive flip. Um, and, and yes, other faiths quote-unquote like christianity have decided to reconcile these things by uh changing themselves eventually and in fact you can study all of this when it comes to the concept of human rights the concept of um you know homosexuality and other things the church always started off reacting against and you know declaring it to be blasphemous or this or that and there was long struggles until finally they just give up so even the concept of human rights, I think the Pope accepted it in the 1960s. They had to do a change in some of the official documents, the church in the Vatican, to accept this idea that human, and then sort of go, oh, human rights, so that's that's God-given human rights, so to sort of to sort of um, Christianize the concept. So it's a dangerous approach because in the end you end up changing the revelation. Um, and if the whole point was to, if the whole point of revelation is that. Allah is the one who has the guidance and we need to follow it, then changing it on the basis of the whims and the desires and the you know, rationalizations of people is a very counterintuitive way to go about things. It's easier, there's a lure, I understand the lure of pragmatism. You be very pragmatic about things. And many people have done that. And I think that's part of the problem in a lot of, a lot of approaches have taken a very pragmatic line, but it ends you up very far away from where you started. And I think that's not what we should be doing. Rather, we should be understanding our deen, trying to understand it as much as possible on its own terms, understanding the world in which we live, and then trying to bring the two together in terms of conveying one in the other, right? And not allowing that this current historically contingent world to make us change that deen. 
that reminds me of a kind of instance um i forgot the name of that christian um uh he talks to like dialogues with a lot of atheists like really popular craig craig yeah, yeah. what's his craig. what's his name craig william lane craig Gr- william lane craig yeah craig. so I, I i watched like one of his talks and he was talking about um someone brought up the whole theory of evolution he's like me and my team have to kind of reconcile that because it you know technically goes right against you know his beliefs but he's trying to find a way to kind of reconcile yeah, it and yeah, metamorphorize yeah, yeah. you know the whole bible you know it, it, it's scary where if you make you know the today's society or the way of thinking you know the yardstick you're gonna That's be right. in with no religion because i don't even believe the whole scientific kind of paradigm is um good enough to attain truth you know it's got its own, it's got its own you know foundations right. and principles that we adore because that's science right mm-hmm. but once it becomes scientism then suddenly these guys have no faith left so right. i guess that's a reflection of what you're talking about that you know you have to be sticking with your principles regardless of you know whatever non-muslim or you know hey preachers of islam basically think that's you know? right and you know evolution is a really good example we've been a couple of some of us a group of us were studying evolution in some detail a little while back and part of that was to look at what scientists and what biologists are saying, evolution biologists, to look at how Christians have responded, how Muslims have responded, the whole sort of the whole sort of um, area. And it was interesting to look at Christian responses. By and large, they all had to in somehow compromise and reconcile and come up with come up with stuff that's just like so counterintuitive. So th- there's a couple of theories that try and um, reconcile human evolution, right? So the other stuff quite not that problematic, but human evolution because you know for the bible it's not very old but according to scientific accounts the earliest humans like 250,000 years or 300,000 years or something like that old and so they will come up with theories literally where they got the story in genesis is a metaphor for a certain group of people 200,000 years ago in the middle east somewhere who had evolved from you know previous species that weren't entirely human and it wasn't even one person in other words Part of it is saying this thing that this Adam person in the Bible is not one person, That's fine. right? And there's other theories and whatnot. It's like, well, why, why are you even doing this? Whereas if you, again, it's not, it, let me emphasize that it's not just about being you know, staunch, if you will, on your belief. It's also about studying the, the theories themselves. It's about studying evolution scientifically, but also more importantly, philosophically, in terms of the... Uh, frames within which it makes sense even right materialism uh, naturalism and when you study it in that sense you see it's not really that big a problem that you need to find some sort of reconciliation for anyway that's not a topic for today but it's a good example where there's a lot of pressure from the society to go what do you say about this and if you say anything you're a problem because if you if you reject the science you're backward and you're dogmatic and you're not you're unreasonable and unscientific and if you you know yeah this is the only sort of way out is to come up with weird interpretations of your text and obviously that's not acceptable for us either yeah like you can even like use an example if rasul saw some you know the society wanting to do a certain way would we even be muslims now that's, you know, right, that's, that's right it's about sticking to what's right because we know like if we have the haq the truth and you know, the qurans from allah it's nothing really to doubt you know and we should stick by it regardless of what people think or else we wouldn't even be muslims that's you know right. yeah. it's not in that it's even there's an amana for those who aren't muslim right so if, if we have the haq as we believe and those who don't have it it's not a, for us it's not a position of elitism going you know ha ha we've got it and they haven't got it it's a trust we're going to take it to them as well but if we start changing it because of what they've brought, right? Because of what other society, the dominant paradigms have brought, then not only are we doing ourselves a disservice, but we're doing all of humanity a disservice. Because where else is... And again, whatever that, whatever Western modernity has brought, there's massive problems in the world. And everyone can see them, right? Um, and and where's, where's any sort of way out of this going to come from? It's not going to come from socialism. That's dead. You know, those experiments didn't go very, very well at all. There's nothing else, right? And so in that sense, not only because obviously for Muslims it should be an obligation-based and Allah seeking Allah's pleasure-based type of thing, but we have a, it's, a, it's a responsibility. Let me put it that way. It's a, it's a trust and a responsibility for us to carry this message, this deen, the way it was revealed to the best of our ability, of course.
like I guess we're talking about from kind of the Muslim perspective. So looking at the Khilafah from a kind of non-Muslim angle. So my kind of other angle of looking at the Khilafah is, you know, we compare it to the current climate. You know, the secular liberal society where you know you don't get like discriminated per se on like I guess the liberal frame if you read it in a book. Or the terms, it's like there's some sort of you know equality amongst regardless of you know race, gender, mm-hmm. or whatever. But I guess if you study, like for example, when Omar Radiallahu who implemented you know um, Islam basically in um, Al Quds when he conquered that area, mm-hmm. it was basically given to him. But um, you would see the stuff that he implemented from a from the society that we live in. If you read into what he actually implemented, so for example, church bells couldn't be rung, um, no new churches could be built. Only the old ones can be sustained. For example, you you see all these things that you can't like openly preach Christianity on the streets as well. So, I guess um, you can argue that in a Khilafah, all these same kind of practices were instilled in a kind of modern society where we all you know somewhat live equally. I would say. Um, do you think it would be problematic for you know people to accept it as a possibility going forward, or what do you reckon? Um, again, I'd say, I'd say that in origin. Obviously, it's an important question about how you want to do things such that people come on board. So it's not; it can't be a paternalistic thing where you want to impose things and then force things and then you know that's that's a that's that's what the communists did. And we saw how that went. At the same time, you don't want to make the people a reference point, as as we said in our last discussion. So there's a balance to be drawn there, right? It's like I gotta I gotta carry Islam as it is, implement Islam as it is. But at the same time, I want to try and do it in ways where I give people the best chance to accept it. I think that's an important distinction. Because on the one hand, I'm not going to go, you know, current liberal society, everyone's equal in theory. Um, and therefore, if we, if Islam brings any sort of distinctions between genders or ethnicities, or, or, or this doesn't apply, or um, actually it does in certain situations, genders or ethnicities, or um, people of different religions, yeah, I just don't know what religions, but people of different Jews, Christians, Muslims, right? If the, if Islam discriminates or I use the word discriminate in a descriptive sense, they just uh, treats differently, right? Not necessarily treats badly, but treats differently. Then somehow that's a problem. So first, of all, anyway, the point is we have to understand from a from a moral point of view that the liberal standard cannot be the criteria, right? And therefore. It's not a problem just because it's not like the current system, the current way things are. Rather, if we think through um, you know, moral issues or the moral question about how morals are established, as Muslim, we have to say it's Allah Ta'ala that determines the morals. It's him, it's him who determines good and bad. Right? The human mind can't do that independently in and of itself. That's the, that's the Islamic position anyway, by and large. Um, and so therefore, you want to take what Islam has and present it in a way that you give people the best chance, right? And I think you give people the best chance by trying to explain and convince of why what you got is better. Now, sometimes you can do that in its detail. Sometimes you can't because it's not rationalizable, right? So, for example, if you're gonna if you're gonna try and explain prayers, uh, salah as to Lord and Asr and different numbers, you're not gonna be able to come up with some sort of rational argument because there is no rational argument, right? This is how Allah Taala wanted it to be. Although People may not even problematize that too much. Um, unlike a rule like the jizya, where Jews and Christians have to pay a particular, and all non-Muslims have to pay a particular tax, if you will. That that will be considered problematic. Yeah, But again, it's it's only going to be considered problematic because it's a different way of doing things. And so, this, so the discussion always goes back to this point about recognizing that there's nothing natural or um, you know, inherently positive or inherently good about the way about about the way things are currently done. That's number one. And if you can show people, that's not hard to show. If you can show people that, I think it's a good starting point. If you put everyone on a, on a on a more level playing field than it currently is. Because currently, it's like liberalism is here, gives people equality and freedom and justice, and everyone else is imposing things, right? Which is nonsense. So you got to bring that down. At the same time, you try and show that in practice, because it's not about the theory. People, you people also appreciate it's not about the theory. Fine, Muslims, uh, Muslims are equal citizens in theory, right? In, in, in the West, but in practice, we see what's going on, right? You know, um, the Aboriginal people, the indigenous nations of all over the West are equal by the law, 
but what, but in practice, mm. right? Mm. So I think an article, an, a particular argument that I found um, good, that I found to be robust in the past, has been to say that Islam is more about in practice equity and not me theoretical equality. It's not about theory. It's not about me saying on paper you're all the same. Rather, they're saying no. In fact, it's it's a recognition of difference. It's going, yep, we're Muslims. Islam is important. Not being Muslim is important, but we recognize your humanity and we're going to treat you as humans, right? As opposed to what liberals do, which is like, yeah, everyone's equal. Everyone's equal, we're the same, but in practice, it's completely the other way around. Sure. White guys here and, you know, Muslims are down there and, and the rest of it. That's one way of looking at it. There's other ways of looking at it, but I think these are the discussions that have, that, that have got to happen. And, and you know, for, to finish, discussions I've had at universities with people who think, uh, you know, slightly deeper levels whether in or outside university I found that it's not difficult to try and show even more Muslims that what we're talking about is different ways of doing things and not not you know I don't have to I don't have to start from a position where what Islam says or does is somehow mor- morally problematic and now I've got to try and defend myself I think it's quite easy to show that there's not much grounds the current system stands on it's just one way of doing things it doesn't really do much doesn't really get much right anyway, but even whether theoretically or in practice, and then to start and go, well, okay, how are we going to look at this and, and have a discussion? That That's where I think we can do our job in trying to give people the best chance to, to find this acceptable, right? But at the same time, we can't make that the reference point. And again, sorry, finally, but it reminds me of the, of the saying of Ali or Delan who said that people should be taught at the levels, right? Um, and taking that in a slightly different way it's not wrong to try and convince people based on what they know, based on, you know, making, try and make it easy for them, right? It's not, it's not just a matter of, it's time to how can I go and present it and people should accept it and if they don't accept it, then they're insincere. No, there's also a responsibility on us in being sensitive to people's individual situations, where they come from, what they think, how they look at things. And we have to understand that so that when we present Islam to them, it can be done in the way that they're most likely to find it receptive. So, uh, like, uh, I guess the distinction you made is between, you know, in theory and in practice. And mm. I think, like, I read, I um, mean, um, Adnan Rashid had a book that he wrote, is the Islam's War on Terror. And mm-hmm. he talked about the treatment of, you know, non-Muslims in Muslim nations back in times. And I think there was an instance where he talked about is um, during uh, Muslim Spain, I think, during that time, the Jews were also flourishing. I think it was also called the Jewish um, Golden Age as well yeah, because yeah, yeah, they were right. flourishing in that time. And some like testified that we ha- we seem like we have more rights and more privileges than the Muslims themselves. Yeah, 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 so, yeah. subhanAllah, I guess like you can look at the history and take out these instances where like, why would, if they'll, if you know, if Jizya was oppressive or taxes of any sort to non-Muslims were oppressive, then why are these guys testifying to all this kind of stuff? That's you right. Know? Yeah, yeah. And that's part, of, that's part of the discussion, right? It's part of the conversation. To bring other historical examples to make these points, um, and and you're right. When you look at it from an angle of equality, sometimes the particular hukum ends up being um, uh, deleterious or, or less in the favor of Muslims themselves. So, for example, if you look at jizya, jizya can in a number of cases be less than zakat, and Muslims have to pay zakat on their land and on their wealth, and non-Muslims don't have to pay zakat. So, if you look at it in the, in that sort of liberal atomistic sense. Sometimes the Muslims are better off, and what are you going to argue that Islam discriminates against Muslims, right? But we just have to be careful that that type of, that type of an argument is an argument to show why the liberal way of looking at things is wrong, not to try and judge Islam one way or the other. It's just say that's a very, it's a very impoverished way of looking at things. Here's a better way that we can start to think about some of these problems. One thing I kind of want to touch on is, you know, I think we established, you know, the whole idea of, you know, fairness and, you know, Muslims and non-Muslims and the idea of Khilafah, but also the idea of, you know, if it was established, I feel like I personally do think this through a lot and it's like, there was a Khilafah today, you know, the amount of, I guess, suffering in the Muslim world today, a lot of it would be fixed. You know, for example, we go through, you know, Rohingya Muslims are suffering, mm-hmm. they're going through, you know, for example, Palestinian uh, Muslims and uh, suffering all over like Syria, Afghanistan. If there was a body of you know a Muslim or a Khilafa, they would be able to you know uh, protect them. And I think I even read example. I think it was like yesterday or something. But 
even um during the time of when there was a khilafah in place, they'll be protecting non-Muslims who were treated yeah. unjustly, right? So, so I think it was like even a Jewish you know group that you know the Ottoman Empire, for example, protected. I can't remember the exact details, mm. but something along those lines. So, do you feel like that is a you know regardless of um, you guys saying that you know the khilafah is important on Muslims, but do you think the element to it that is uh, missing is the fact that we have it, it's a means to kind of help the Muslims that are struggling. It is. That's one of the things that it will affect in a positive way. Um, because you have to appreciate the, the, the issues in the Muslim world, the various political conflicts and tribulations. One common thread they all have in terms of dealing with these issues is that we don't have any united leadership to even begin to think about the problems, let alone deal with them. Right? So in other words, if you have you take the issue of the Rohingya, or Afghanistan or Iraq before that, or in Yemen now, or anywhere, right? In, anywhere in the world, uh, in Africa, in Asia, in the Middle East, numerous problems. But how can you even begin to do anything without someone thinking through and then doing something, right? So either, and obviously this is a big issue, it's not like one boy, I sit down, it's got to be some sort of authority, some sort of uh, someone who's got... Um, power, someone who's got some sort of political authority. And so unless we're relying on the UN or the OIC, these Organization of Islamic Councils, Islamic countries, sorry, not councils, or the Arab League, right? Everyone knows the reality of these organizations, right? So who who, who are we expecting? Are we expecting the regimes themselves? They're part of the problem. You know, whether it be the Bangladeshi regime with the Rohingya or the Burmese or Pakistan or Saudi Arabia or anyone if we properly understand these regimes to be part of the problem and the international organisations to also be part of the problem, who do we expect to even begin to think about addressing them in, in the way that Islam wants or the, that is in the interest of Muslims? There's no one there. So, so the Ummah is without a head. It's like it's without a head. That's why it's, 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 it's in this state of frenzy and it's a state of um, extreme pain and suffering, right? And so that's an obvious one. You need some sort of leadership that's sincere, that wants to find a solution based on Islam that we're going to move forward and do things. So yes, definitely one of the big points um, that the Khilafah will address is the, all the various issues in the Muslim world. But even beyond that, as you said, even the non-Muslim world. And that's why Islam Islam is, is, is a way of life for everyone, not just for the Muslims. And that's that's the way, that's the way our outlook should be, that we seek to address or take Islam to the, all, all the world for the benefit of everyone, right? Not as others have done it, where it's for their own benefit. It's not as for the spreading of khair and rahmah around the world. And I guess the other kind of issue that uh, happens is you know, there's certain countries that might be Muslim and there's a certain group of Muslims that are struggling, but that Muslim country can't help those guys because they made a treaty with a non-Muslim country mm. who hate those guys who are suffering. So it's all it's not even like it's just disunity on disunity yeah. amongst the ummah, you know. And I guess... That's a really big problem, but you just mentioned a point about you know um, you know Islam being for the whole world. So, do you reckon <laughs> this is a question that might be a bit controversial? But can a um, a land, for example, with the group being a minority Muslim, be run by Hilafa? Oh, it can in theory, but in, in practice, at least the at least the um, the, the core uh, or the starting point, the launching point of the Hilafa. Is much more likely to be in a in a Muslim in a Muslim land, and that's only because, um, you know, the, the establishment of an, a governance or a political entity requires some level of public opinion, and it also requires material force, some sort of force that stands behind your project or what you're trying to do, right? And so, in other words, you need people, you need hearts and minds, and you're you're, you're much more likely to convince Muslim hearts and minds. Of the need for Khilafah than you are non-Muslims, right? So it's not out of the question and obviously with the Prophet Sallallahu he was working with non-Muslims, they were non-Muslim in Mecca when he came, right? So it's not out of the question, um, it's not an impossibility outright, but in in our reality where there's, you know, uh, a billion odd uh, Muslims around the world, then it makes much more sense that you'd expect the starting point at least where the Khilafah begins to be in the Muslim world, but then it will expand, it'll expand out. And like it did in the past, many times in the past, when it expanded, it went to areas where the majority was non-Muslim. 
and they didn't convert overnight either, right? Uh, many parts of the Levant, Sham region, was like this, Egypt perhaps, and other parts of the world were, were like this. It took time for them to see Islam um, before they um, opened their hearts to its light. And that's another very important point. From a Dawah perspective, there's a theoretical Dawah and there's a practical Dawah, right? Both individual and society. So individually, I can talk to people a lot and go, you need to do this and do that. But if I acted it out myself, that's much more forceful. That's much more influential, if you will. Even though both need to go hand in hand. It's not about only acting it out but not saying anything. You need both. But the, but the practice is forceful. Likewise, on a societal level, it's one thing to go, oh, we will, Islam has a wonderful economic system. It's not based on riba. It doesn't lead to rich getting richer, the poor getting poorer. And our political system doesn't is not subject to the you know, ills of democracy and electoral politics where people have to come in five years and have to appeal to the lowest common denominator in the in the you know in the electorate, blah blah blah. Sounds nice, but where is it? Right? And a lot of people say that and you, you probably can't blame them, although perhaps you should you should perhaps they should be thinking with a broader horizon. But in the end that's human beings and there's nothing like practical demonstration. And that's, that's the difference. That's what we saw in the Islam of the Prophet Sallallahu where in 13 years in Mecca and the first, let's say, we compare the first 13 years in Medina with the 13 in Mecca, there's no difference in the message. There's no difference in who's conveying the message. The Prophet hasn't changed, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. It's not as if they didn't know in Mecca of his great character and his great morals. So what was different? The only difference in the two periods was in the second one, he had the backing of a political authority. He had a political authority on his side. But the difference was in Mecca, there was a hand, there was a few hundred max who accepted Islam in the, in the first 13 years, in the whole period in Mecca. And there was literally thousands, if not hundreds of thousands in the first 13 years in Medina. And that's because I don't have to, I don't have to go and say, Islam's this and not this, and you know, imagine it in your head, it's there. Right? And, and it's, that, it's that practical aspect that is much more powerful. And that's why the Khilafah is also critical for Da'wah. And this is a very, very important message. Even even da'is, even da'wah organizations are still very, very individual-based. They're out there to convert individuals as if you're going to convert hundreds and then thousands and then millions and then you're going to get the world to the other way, right? Which I'm saying that the efforts are good and they should continue. But the 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 horizon's got to be more, the, the way they understand things, the way they address things has got to be far broader. And you have to understand that in the end, complemented you have to complement that work with, with work that is more politically oriented um, that works to practically establish the Dawah. Right? And then take it forth just as the Prophet Sallallahu did. And like to kind of wrap it up, I just want to ask, like uh, we talked about, you know, how nice the life will be and this, that, um, protect people that are suffering, for example, and, you know, um, a lot of things that we can't do as Muslim, you'll complete the deen in that way and whatnot. But, there, you know, there are issues in the Khilafah, for example, like to take an example is, you know, Ali and Muawiyah radiallahu anhu, you know, mm-hmm. there might be like two leaders that rise. Like, how can you say that, okay, um, we'll have a Khilafah and then it'll be all good because, you know, I guess in history we've seen, you know, people being assassinated, like Omar radiallahu anhu was assassinated, for example, mm-hmm. all this kind of stuff that uh, can happen and, you know, disunite the, the whole Ummah, for example, as well. So what's your kind of response to that. Well, that's I think there's there's a problem with the premise there. It's not it's not the right understanding to say that the Khilaf is going to make everything all good. That's not this earthly life is never meant to be all good. It's that's the whole point. It's meant to be trials and tribulations and tests. And if things were all good, there wouldn't be tests in the first place. So part of the problem again, and then ironically, this is another. Well, there's two different concepts that come across from the again from secular liberal Western modern ways of thinking uh one is utopia uh even though the west has moved on but it was um what's his name it was a monk christian monk thomas thomas more thomas more wrote a book called utopia in around 16th century 15th century in which he described literally the book is a description of a place that is a utopia right and since then even before then but since then it's been a big part of literature and of philosophy to talk about politics and where it takes you your political endeavors, and of course, and then there's been dy- dystopias, and that's been a big aspect as well. Anyway, that's one. But the other, the more influential aspect coming through from uh, various foreign 
ways of thinking is, 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 is how can I put it, that the promised land is on earth, if you will. That the, 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 the green, the promise, the heaven is on earth. And you, we don't understand it in this depth. Secularism, modernity, the enlightenment, uh, insofar as it eminent, eminentizes life, if I put that, what that means is it circumscribes life to this world. It makes the worldly more important, right? Uh, it doesn't necessarily say there is no afterlife. You can believe that if you want. But as far as, you know, societal... Um, public views are concerned, it's irrelevant. And so naturally, over time, the worldly becomes the most important aspect of life. It's the only aspect of life, and so it's more important. And therefore, as human beings, where we have where we have this instinct or this need, this want for things to be good, it's got to be in this life. And in this context, liberalism comes and promises you equality and freedom and economic prosperity and blah, blah, blah. Right? And even in that sense, that's, that's from there as well. So we've got to keep that in mind. Having said that, the point is that there's no utopia on earth, not khilaf and not anything else can create utopias on earth. And that's why there's nothing wrong with Omar being assassinated or whatever happening. That's part and parcel. Having said that, so the question may arise, well, what does the khilaf do then if it's, if it's still going to be like that? But the point is still nevertheless that two things. Number one, the reason we strive for something like khilaf is not because somehow we're going to have rivers of honey and milk on earth or because Allah wants us to, Right? But number two, yes, to the extent that it gives manifestation, practical manifestation to a way of life ordained by Allah, it's the closest that any human endeavor can get to getting things right on earth. It's the closest. It's not going to get there, but it's the closest. And so, yes, if you do it properly, you're not going to have these massive inequalities of rich and poor. You shouldn't have these massive inequalities of rich and poor. right? Um, and like that, the various other excesses that we see liberalism bring and other ones that socialism brought in certain places or communism anyway brought in certain places. Um, and so we might say in summary that the Khilafah will produce much better um, systems for humanity f- for, for life on earth. But by no means will it be utopia. There'll be issues, there'll be wars, there'll be struggles, there'll be oppression, there'll be corrupt rulers. And that's all part and parcel because that's the point of life. Allah will test people in all sorts of ways. Um, and and primarily that's through difficulty, which is what how life is meant to be. I guess like this whole conversation, I hope inshallah like, people benefit in the sense of you know they hear these words of you know um, hilafa, you know Islam in portrayed in that way in a political kind of light. It makes them you know intrigued. You know, hearing this conversation, it's like we can talk about this in a very intellectual, mm. uh, deep way, and mm. then they can study you know because th- there's different realms of Islam. You know, there's the obviously spiritual side, there's yes. the realistic side, and it makes me even personally like intrigued to read upon you know all these things because as you like as much as it's cliche you know cliche as you know islam's a way of life you mm, know mm. it's a dean it is a way of life like everything you can think of you know the way we walk into the toilet for example yes, you know yes. it's will dictate not some way to like how to you know basically run a country for example so um, I guess, like, without stretching the conversation too far, but Jazakallah Khair, Uthman, for coming on to Boys in the Hair. Um, yeah, I hope you enjoyed it, and I'll probably, you know, see your training soon, inshallah. Yeah, yeah, no, no, so no, it was good. great, it was great. Um, um, yeah. Jazakallah for having me on. And uh, I just say, look, obviously, we touched upon these issues very broadly, and we covered a lot of ground, but I encourage people to... There's a lot of material out there that I think where details can be garnered from. But it's really about... It's, it's about people... Uh, taking that step in, uh, um, you know, in their minds first, understanding the importance. So, yep, this is important. It's important for me to expand my horizon in terms of what Islam covers. Yes, the political side is important. Yes, Khilaf is important. And once they do that, then that opens the path for them. It paves the way for them to to manifest that importance by going out and learning more. Right. So let let conversations like this, in other words, be a means for you to actually go out and do what needs to be done. Um, a beginning, if you will, a beginning of the conversation and not not an end in any way. Yeah, inshallah. And just not be fed by the narrative you're told about the world, you know, within that's right, that's society. Right, that's right. So yeah, um, for all our listeners, thank you so much for giving us your attention. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to email us at boysinthecave at gmail.com or find us on Facebook. And you can also follow our journey through Instagram. The people running this podcast are young Muslim uni students from Sydney, Australia. So if you want to continue uh, help improving 
and helping us with our content, support us by becoming a Patreon today. Um, go on to patreon.com slash boys in the cave. Um, right now, we actually have an Adam Alay Salam reward package. If you donate a small amount uh, monthly, you can get exclusive access to special content, inshallah. So, yeah, um, also please leave us a five star rating on iTunes as that will greatly help us. And, um, you know, inshallah, we'll gain more traction through your support through uh, iTunes and other, you know, podcast sets that you use, inshallah. So if you want to, you know, feel free to message on Facebook as well. And if you want to, you know, get your contact details, and I'm sure maybe someone wants to shoot a message to Uthman, for example, I'll give um, links to his email um, in the show notes, inshallah. So from our special guest, Uthman Badar, and myself, we wish you all the best. This is Tanzim signing you off. Assalamu alaikum. لقد قلنا إذا شططا هؤلاء قوم اتخذوا من دونه آلهة لولا يأتون عليهم بسلطان بين فمن أظلم ممن افترى على الله كذبا